Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We have uh, some behind the scenes on our live show on barbecue slash our tour through three cities in Texas, uh, which was an adventure, a totally different adventure from the last time we went to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, last time we went to Texas, we got diverted to Shreveport. Uh, this time, all of our travels were pretty smooth. All of our travels were pretty smooth. Before the time that uh, we, so we had gone to do a live show at the Dallas Museum of Art on approach to the Dallas airport, we got diverted to Shreveport, and we found out we had been diverted once we were on the ground. That was a whole uh, little adventure. Uh, but then also the one time I had been to Texas before that by air, I had what continues to be the worst in-flight experience of my life in terms of the turbulence level, and it put me off of flying for more than a decade after that. Uh, and so I had I had some assorted Texas travel baggage. <laughs> <laughs> once I was home from all of it and had not even had, like there had been, I had had no flight delays of a meaningful amount and like pretty smooth flights. Everything went really smoothly. I was like, okay, I feel pretty good about this. Yeah. Uh, Knockwood, I mean, I almost, I... Even though we're done with tour for this year, mm-hmm. I'm scared to say it all went well. Like something will come and bite us in some way we haven't <laughs> foreseen. But we had uh, pretty good fortune throughout our travels, both in the yeah. Midwest and through Texas. Even I, on one leg of it, had like a 15-minute turnaround in an airport where I had to make a connector. And that went fine. Big thanks to the Delta app for now having maps in the app of the terminal you're flying into so you can see exactly how you have to get to the next place. That's nice. Because I just booked it off my flight and I knew exactly where to go and I made it no problem. Like I literally got to the next gate as they were boarding my group and I just walked right on so it worked out perfectly. Um, But yeah, we had a great time in Texas. We ate a lot of spectacular food in every city we were in. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like I need to apologize to you because when we talked about Lexington Barbecue, (laughs) and your form of slaw. Even though we, whenever we have a live show, we try to get that outline to one another ahead of time, more so than we would if we were recording the show in the studio. And we review it several times because it is live and you want it to be as smooth as possible. But for some reason, even though I had read it probably at that point seven times, I had always completely missed that whole thing about ketchup being used in the coleslaw that you grew up with. And so yeah. when it came up in the show, I was like, what? Yuck! Which is not <laughs> cool. That's not cool at all. It's totally fine. People like what they like. And I did feel like, and it didn't really occur to me until afterward, if I am making a, a coleslaw or eating a coleslaw that's made with with a lot of mayonnaise, like usually it's it's pretty, There's uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of mayonnaise. But with Lexington-style barbecue slaw, like, the end result isn't gloppy in any way. It doesn't feel like it's saturated with ketchup. Like, I wouldn't even know that ketchup is necessarily the ingredient without reading a lot of recipes about how to make it myself because you can't buy it anywhere in Massachusetts. Right. Does it just have, like, a tomato-y appeal or a look to it? Like a light the, tomato? It looks, uh, it, it, uh, the color of it is pretty reddish, it does not look like it's drenched in ketchup or tomato sauce or anything like that because a lot of the component ingredients that go into it make up a lot of barbecue sauces. Sometimes people will make it with a barbecue sauce instead of with ketchup. It kind of depends on who's doing what. But it winds up having a spicy quality to it. Huh. Um, I really enjoy it. So my favorite thing in terms of Lexington-style barbecue is to have a barbecue sandwich with the slaw on top served on a hamburger bun. Really delicious. I know. All, everyone in the audience is, like, just waiting with bated breath. What kind <laughs> of barbecue does Tracy like best? Um, the, so for folks who were not on any of our Texas tour, I think, apart from the random scattering of North Carolinians who were in the various audiences who have transplanted to Texas, uh, the revelation of what that slaw is like just brought on abject horror from everyone. It was a little shocking for... <laughs> Yeah. For the audience every night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then the other thing was when we chose barbecue as the topic because we wanted something that seemed like fun, and because the tour was uh, was in Texas, we wanted something that felt kind of Texasy. Like we said that in the intro. Um, 
I wasn't really uh, concerned about that as a topic until we got closer to it. And I was like, what if people, uh, like we've heard very from various uh, folks in the audience who don't eat meat about their preferences of, regarding how we would talk about meat on the episode. And I was like, what if, what if people don't like what we're talking about? And then after we did the first one, I was like, what if everybody's opinions about barbecue are so strong that no one has fun on the rest of this show? Uh, but I think people did have fun, so it worked out. Yeah, everybody went into it with really, really uh, a great sense of humor. And even though I, all of our audiences were really fun and that they were very reactive and they would let you know how they felt about the barbecue we were talking about, but it was mm-hmm. all in a really, really fun sense. Like, I never felt like, oh, they, they're against us at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a great time. It was so spectacularly fun. I had been worried. I mentioned this during the show in a part that that isn't uh, going to air, that I've been worried because I'm not the biggest fan of barbecue generally. It turns out that I have recently had Texas barbecue prior mm-hmm. to going on this tour, and I freaking loved it. So um, I'm very pleased that that worked out for me because then I was on a tour of delicious things, uh, mm-hmm. and I could sample Texas barbecue throughout the state, which was a very good piece of fortune for me. Yes. I would also like to say I had a, um, in Houston, I had a very delicious vegetarian lunch because after the first two days of the tour, which involved a whole lot of meat and cheese, my body was like, hey, how about some vegetables? Yeah, I didn't I didn't have that problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I got home, my body was like, please eat nothing but broccoli for the next two days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I needed some, some leafy greens. Uh, but <laughs> we had a great, great time. We did. Tracy, I have exciting news. What is it? For the first time in a few years, I think I might have holiday spirit. Oh, yeah? <laughs> You've been a little grinchy? Is that what you're telling me? I don't. It's not even that I've been grinchy. I've just been too busy. Yeah. And even though I'm actually probably busier this year than I've been in previous years, I don't know. We're just feeling it. We're also going to try a Christmas tree this year. Oh, wow. For the first time in, like, five or six years. Because last time we attempted it, our cats destroyed it. Uh-huh. And we, we haven't done it since. Or we've put up, like, a very tiny two-footer. But I got... A seven-foot bright purple Christmas tree this year. (laughs) That sounds awesome. We have not put it up yet. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, I think we're doing the opposite and not putting up a tree because... You have kittens. uh, We have kittens, and we also have the first time that we're leaving them with a pet sitter overnight during the season when a tree would be up. Yeah. And we're a little nervous about that. We don't want to do it. That is 100% valid. I think even with ours, we're just going to put plush on the trees. That sounds great. uh, It it did occur to me if I can find, and I think you gave me a cute gorilla ornament (gasps) that we covered uh, several years ago in one of our previous installments that's wooden, so that won't break if it falls off. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a a flat wooden carving. Um, And we're going to do little plush things, I think, for a lot of it to be safe because, again... I love them, but I don't trust them. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Uh, I also feel like we should mention one of the most harrowing aspects of doing any of these international holiday episodes. Yes. Is always a language issue. Yep. I always feel terrible, particularly when we get to any Asian words, because I butcher them, and that is not my intent. We actually got an email from a listener once about how disrespectful he found it, and I was like, I am not trying to disrespect anybody. I assure you... I'm just not good at this. Yeah, neither of us speaks a tonal language, which Japanese is not, to be clear. But, like, neither of us speaks a tonal language. And uh, there's a lot that goes into trying to get pronunciations right on the show. Like, there's a ton of time that is spent trying to fine-tune. But even at the same time, for the vast majority of languages on the planet, you and I are are beginners. Like, yeah, absolute beginners. It's like being on your first day of a foreign <laughs> language class. When every you, time. Every time. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of time and effort that gets put into that. But, like, we're always going to sound like we don't know how to speak this language because we, we don't. Yeah. I also have the really bad habit of, because the only other language that I've spent a good deal of time with, and I'm not even proficient in it, but I'm better in it than anything else, is French. Mm -hmm. 
I pronounce everything with a French accent. <laughs> well, <laughs> which is terrible. <laughs> We've also gotten that as advice from someone on pronunciations before. Like, I just heard it works really well if you just pronounce everything as though it sounds French. And I'm like, that's not correct. <laughs> that's a fast way to uh, offend a lot of people and make sure they don't know what you're talking about. Uh, though it might sound pretty just in terms of like musicality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably not for the best. But uh, yeah, so I it's one of those things I also really, really loved. I did not know much prior to this episode about the seven lucky gods. Mm-hmm. And I kind of love that idea of uh, visiting seven different shrines and just kind of spending time with your hopes for the year in that way. Yeah. Uh, which is something I'm trying to figure out, like a, a way to incorporate a similar idea of just um, not just rushing through my my resolutions list, which I make sure. one every year, and I love them. I, I'm a big fan of the resolutions list. I know it's not for everybody. Uh, but really thinking about what I am what I hope for in the new year in a way that's a little bit less goal-oriented and more just hopeful. Yeah, So that's lovely. This episode ended up kind of giving me uh, food for thought about how I think about 2020. So you, you did the research on this one, and when you sent the outline to me, um, I thought, thought that the seven lucky gods were entirely new information. But then when I went to get artwork for the episode and I saw pictures of them, I was like, oh, I've seen like this picture. Yeah. And this grouping of like, I've seen this in a lot of places. So it was nice to to have the context for this imagery that I've seen (laughs) that I was already familiar with and didn't realize. Yeah, and even though they all do have individual personalities and and um, associations in terms of their virtues, they usually are depicted in a group together. And I had similarly, I had seen images of them, but I didn't realize what I was looking at. So right. I felt like this kind of expanded my worldview a little bit and opened up my brain. So thank you for the world of... <laughs> of history and traditions because we learn stuff that can impact us in positive ways. Uh, Yeah. I I hope that is how listeners feel about things as well. (laughs) Uh, And once again, I just want to make sure everybody, no matter what you're celebrating, has a fantastic, fantastic end to the year. Yeah. And if if you're celebrating nothing, I also hope that you (laughs) have a great year end. Yeah. The holidays can be rough for people. It comes with a lot of different different flavors of baggage. For sure. Uh, And if just getting through the end of the year is what feels like success for you, bravo. Uh, We hope that you have that and that it is the smoothest possible journey through a potentially difficult time. So thank you for listening all year round. uh, And we really appreciate having you with us this year and every year. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 